that it has absolutely cemented the use of orthodox economics, which is based on uh, certain visions of capitalism, uh, which I'm going to come to, and made it mandatory. There is no education in economics in any graduate program anywhere in the world that is not based on the idea of rational choice, perfect knowledge, perfect individuals, optimality of the market, uh, general equilibrium, all of the standard tropes, and these are required and all done mathematically, because if you do it mathematically, it seems more imposing. Now, I was lucky I had a foundation uh, in engineering, and so when I studied some physics, so this did not impress me at all, but most people are terribly impressed by the fact that you can lay all this out in mathematics. So, uh, the purpose of the prize, as I said, was to turn the economics profession to the right. But the right has two meanings here. One meaning is back to the idea of capitalism as an ideal system, at least in principle. And that is the foundation of all economics in, in graduate programs now. And the other, which was sort of byproduct in the beginning, was uh, the idea that the market actually in practice reflected this vision. And that second idea was eroded over time by the reality of capitalism. As uh, struggles across the world erupted, as underdevelopment came, as the World Bank got embroiled in doing all these things to support markets, and then they didn't work out that way, and then ultimately crises began to undermine this. Nonetheless, if you go anywhere in the world today, almost all economists will be of this persuasion, whether they are progressive politically, like Stiglitz and Krugman, or whether they are right-wing, like many, many of the others. Lucas is an example, Robert Lucas who believes in rational expectations. The standard models which are used by the central banks of the world are models in which there is one person all of humanity is represented what's called a representative agent who has perfect knowledge of the present and the future. And that person makes choices based on the future consequences of anything. And then there's one firm that adapts itself to the wishes of this uh, omnipotent consumer. And from this, you get the idea that uh, everything is perfect, that one uh, addition to the old model was the idea that when you ask what does it mean for people to have perfect knowledge of the future, the concession is something called rational expectations, which is to say that since the future is somewhat indeterminate, you are never exactly right, but this representative agent is uh, right up to a statistical random error. That's important that the error is random. Because if it's random, nobody can learn from mistakes. Therefore, the uh, collective individual is essentially right. And uh, so you can't talk about errors or anything of that sort. These are very fundamental propositions. And any graduate student would have to uh, learn all of these. What's striking is that this is the models used by uh, central bankers and most policy people across the world in order to judge how capitalism works. And by the way, there's no role in these models for the financial sector. It's quite amazing. Uh, after the 2008 crisis, uh, the Queen reportedly asked her economists, why did you see it coming? And the answer was, well, we had no, uh, in our model, there's no role for banks or credit. And when I, uh, was invited to give a lecture at the Central Bank uh, of the Bank of England. I asked them, what the hell went on? They said, well, we're working on including money into the model that we use. Uh, this is really extraordinary because if you know anything about Marx and you know anything about uh, the classical economic tradition, money appears in the beginning because it's so central to the vision of capitalism. All exchange is done through the mediation of money. Money allows you to break the circuit anytime you want, because if you need to hold it, as in a time of crisis, then the rest of the circuit is not completed because what you don't spend, they don't get, and therefore they don't hire and so on. Yet in these models, there is literally no mathematical space for money. 
except if things are imperfect. So money is seen as an imperfection. Uh, this notion that you begin with perfection and you move to reality as an imperfection is fundamental to orthodox economics, whether they're progressive or not. Stiglitz and Krugman say the same thing. They start from this foundation. And yet, uh, when you ask them, why do you do that? They go, well, you just take another assumption of the foundation, which is fundamental, and you vary it a little bit, introduce imperfections, and you get some results that mimic the real, and that's it. Of course, each one of these imperfections is applied to a different set of assumptions, and so they're not coherent because there is no general theory of imperfections.